Today's passage will be 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 to 7. Um, The passage can be found on page 1148 in the Blue Church Bibles, or it'll be on the screen behind me. So again, 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 to 7, page 1148 in the Blue Church Bibles, if you're using one of those. Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all of you were as I am, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Thanks, Beth. Am I on? Can people hear me okay? Um, It's worth uh, repeating what Ralph said a second ago, but uh, with this being a um, rather... um, different topic. It's if you want to take your children next door or have a read-through, then uh, that's absolutely fine, but um, there's no aim for it to be uh, inappropriate in any way, shape, or form, and it is God's word, so we are excited to dive into uh, this topic. Um, Yeah, so we are starting a new sermon series going through marriage, divorce, and singleness, and these three topics are going to be really helpful for us because um, Corinthians has written to a a church that is young, with lots of new Christians who are wanting to be serious about following God, who have a bunch of questions for Paul. What does following Jesus look like in my private life? How do we do that together as a church? What does Christian marriage look like? Is it better to be married or is it better to be single? How do we love and care for people at different life stages? And do you know, church, One of the big things that we've been praying about as we're just looking at going through this sermon series is that it would be helpful for all of us um, together, but it wouldn't be a case where all the singles would just turn up and listen to sermon number three. Um, But all the married people would dial into this one, but then, you know, go, maybe I'll go see my family on the third week. You know, who knows? It's not relevant towards me. You You know, one of the things that's going on in our churches, we are growing a lot. And that is wonderful and really exciting. But actually, as we get more and more people from different backgrounds, socioeconomic, racial, or life status, it becomes more and more easy for us to just hang out with people like ourselves, to segregate and to become cliquey, become a little bit nervous about hanging out with and getting to know people who are different to ourselves. But, but we don't come here because we just all happen to like to sing songs. We come here because we know the truth of the gospel, and that is something deeper that binds us all together. And we long to be the type of church where all of us understand and care and love each other because what binds us together is not that we are going through similar things, but because we love the God who has given his life for us and he he holds us together. And the easiest way to do that, the way to get better at that, is to, to understand different people's life stages, to think about them, to pray about them, and in doing so, find our hearts be more open to care deeply about them and want good for them. So if you're married, can I encourage you, would you particularly focus and dial in on sermon two and three and think and pray about how you might serve and love your brothers and sisters there? If you are single, would you think and pray about things today, about what this is saying, and not just think, oh, this is irrelevant, it doesn't matter to me. No, there are so many married people here who would benefit and be blessed by you knowing a bit more about their lives, praying for them and loving them. And it's with that in mind that we're going to launch into this passage. So let me pray and we'll get straight into it. Father, this is a challenging passage to think and look about. But Lord, ultimately, we love going through your word because we know that all of it is inspired by you. All of it is perfect and good and builds us up. And so we pray that as we look at the um, good things, the benefit of marriage, would you open our eyes to the beauty of your love and your commitment to us? Help us to see how Jesus cares for us. Help us to see how he loves us. Help us to expect and hope that we might be changed by him today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So Paul starts in verse 1 with these words. Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. 
it's written as though he's quoting a question from the Corinthians. Some other translations might put it a different way, but, but it, it seems to be a good translation in the NIV where it's saying, the Corinthian church is asking Paul, should we not have sexual relations anymore? Should people remain single? Is that the way forward? And then what we see is verses 2 to 9 give an answer to that, talking about what marriage is, talking about what sex is, and talking a bit about what singleness is. So they're going to be the three things that we're going to look at today. What marriage is, what sex is, and what singleness is. is, is. Let's launch right into it uh, with what marriage is. Marriage is a gift. You see that in verses 1 to 6. It's clear that if you have sexual desires... Getting married is an appropriate thing to look to do. Although the Corinthian church is asking whether this is a bad thing, Paul's answer is if you have those desires and those aims, then, then, then getting married is, is, is a response. It's a good thing to do. In fact, Paul elsewhere in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 to 33, talks about how marriage is a great gospel mystery that reflects Christ and the church. Marriage is a good gift that involves selfless giving. You're seeing that in verses three and four when he's talking about giving of one another in, within the confines of marriage. But why is marriage a good gift? Because it's a covenant. By covenant, I mean a lifelong commitment of devoting yourself to another person. A covenant binds you to a person, giving a safe place for vulnerability, giving a safe place for, as we see here, sex. It's a deeper relationship than a contract. A contract is just, you know, a quick deal. So if I turn to Etienne and went, hey, Etienne, I'll give you 20 quid for your, um, for your strap on your guitar and the strings. It's just a contract. It's just a quick deal. He can kind of say yes or no. There's no lifelong commitment. I'm not going to hang out with him afterwards. Or maybe I will because he's kind of cool. But, but, you know, most of the time, it's just one thing that you do and then it's over. But marriage is completely different to a contract. Marriage is beautiful and it is deep and it involves covenantal relationship. It involves a commitment. What, what do we do when we see a marriage? We see two people stand before each other and say wonderful vows and everyone, their friends and family, are delighted to see them. Delighted to see those vows. It's the pinnacle of that time. It's beautiful. Every, people are, think it's wonderful. There's nobody who's going to want to go, can, can you get Etienne to come stand up here and just talk about buying his guitar strings? I mean, I can't wait to see how that goes. It's so wonderful. Why? Because it's not deep. There's no real commitment there. And that's why a covenant is so important. Just a couple of years ago, I, I went to a humanist wedding and, and the vows there were slightly different. Um, our friends turned to each other and, and they said, I promise to laugh with you. I promise to cry with you. I promise to have fun with you. And I was like, is that it? And my wife had to like grab me by the, you know, subtly by the phone, like, Shh, stop, stop it. Like it because it, in my mind, I was thinking, that's not a deep commitment. I mean, I can have that, that I can make those promises to the delivery driver. Like I, I, I promise to laugh and cry with you. We'll have fun, same time next week. Like it's just, it, it, there's nothing deep there. But, but actually, a covenant marriage is deep, because what does it do? It doesn't talk about the right now. It doesn't say, you make me happy, so we might stay together. You make me feel romantic, you make me feel happy all inside, and I'm so welling up with you that this is why we're going to be together. It points forwards. It goes, I promise I will love you, for better or for worse, in sickness or in health for richer and for poorer. It assumes those wonderful feelings right now, but it is making a promise forward in front of all friends and family to be held accountable. This is why marriage is beautiful, because it is two people turning to each other and going, I will give you my life. No matter how it turns out, I will devote myself towards you. And in that confines, there's something beautiful because that mirrors Christ's work towards us. He goes to us as we reject him. He goes, I will give you all that I am. I will come into earth. I will die for you and I will sacrifice myself so that you might have life and I will bind myself to you. You will be my people and I will be your God and I will love you in that way, which is why marriage is that great gospel mystery. It is beautiful. It is a covenant. And we can clearly see that the, that the Bible says that this is a good thing. The covenantal love of Jesus is reflected right here in verses two to six, which is why it is the safe place for sex. Takes us to point number two. Marriage is a gift, but 
Sex is also a good gift. See verse 2. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. Verse 3 and 4. A husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Sex within marriage is a good thing. Paul prohibits sex outside of marriage, referring to that as sexual immorality, something that is not good and right. But Paul recommends sex within marriage. Do you feel it get a bit prickly all of a sudden and a bit weird and a bit tense? We, we don't quite know what to do with that, do we? We don't quite know what to say or how to respond. I can feel the hairs on my back kind of going, Ding! It, it, it's just a little bit, just a little bit awkward. Why? Because... Our society doesn't know what to do with this. We have two responses towards the topic of sex in our world. Number one is to pretend that it is everything, and number two is to pretend that it's nothing. So one where we are obsessed about it, and one where we go, it's dirty, just ignore it, let's not talk about it. You see that in the world, right? So on one hand, our culture uses sex to sell everything. I mean, there are Carl's Jr. adverts and Lynx adverts where they are using sex to sell burgers and face cream. What? They're not linked in any way. But it, 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 the thought there is that drives sales. So we'll, we'll use it because everything is about that. We'll just make everything about that. On the other hand, there's that, that prude, awkward overreaction where we go, actually, because that seems grotesque, that seems over the top, let us ignore this topic. Let us never talk about it. Let us push it down and say that it's just something that is not appropriate. And do you see that the Bible does neither? The Bible doesn't say that this topic is everything, nor does the Bible say that this topic is irrelevant. Let's ignore it. Let's never talk about it. it. It makes it something that is worth talking about, but it's not the central story of the Bible. The central story of the Bible is that God loves us. He has died for us, and if we trust in him, we have faith in him, and we have life eternal to enjoy with him. Marriage is a picture of that, and sex is a wonderful gift for us to enjoy in there. But, but it's not the main thing. It is there, though, throughout the Bible. In Proverbs 5, it tells us that husbands should, husbands' bodies and wives' bodies should be enjoyed by each other as they enjoy each other's love. It's there throughout Song of Solomon where it says, I am my beloved and he is mine. We are sick with love. God has designed marriage to be passionate and for there to be appropriate expressions of love right there. In fact, Paul encourages and he commands this. But do you see what it looks like? Verses 3 and 4. It looks like mutual giving. Whether wife gives of herself, whether husband gives of himself, because there is love and there is care and there is a picture there that's reflected right of marriage, right? So marriage is going, I will give you my entire life and I will devote myself to you. And in that context is the appropriate way to say, and as part of that, I will give you my body too. Let me enjoy you, let you enjoy me. It's there, but it's the safe place for us to see this good and right, wonderful gift. If we don't see it in that way, as mutual giving, as caring, as, as loving for one another, then it is right for pain, for wrongness, for abuse. The moment that we move from, how can I please you, let me prioritize you, let me love you, to let me take what I want, it breaks down and it becomes something horrible, something negative, something painful. We see that, don't we, in a warning in verse 5. Do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come, again, come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. It's, it's right to take some time to pray and, and to, to take some time to be... Um, together in different ways. But Paul is saying, enjoy the gift regularly. In fact, if you don't, you will find yourself in trouble because there is a possibility that Satan will tempt you in unhelpful ways. Do you notice that? It's not that Satan creates sexual desire. That is not what's happening here. But Satan is able to twist it. He is able to make it something wrong, something unhelpful. And he's able to use that to then hurt and harm us and draw us away from each other. It's what we see when people misuse sex. 
When people misuse verses three and four and demand something and take what they want, what is the definition of sin that we understand? It's actually been in there throughout Mark, as Rouse preached on it and some others, where we say a really simple one, shove off God, I'm in charge, no to your ways. And in some senses, isn't that the same thing that happens when sex is used wrongly? It is going, let me take what I want. No, 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 God, I don't trust in your ways. I'm in charge. No to what you say. I'm going to take what I want, which is what we see with the Christian leaders who have fallen sexually and have, have been inappropriate throughout what we've seen in the news. It's what we see in the worst cases with Maxwell and with Epstein, or even what we've seen recently in the news with famous actor and model, James Franco. He got in trouble, didn't he? Because he was teaching acting, but he was also sleeping with his students. And he is quoted as saying, I didn't care about them, I just took what I want. Isn't that the definition of sin? Isn't that the definition of of what is unhelpful? And in this case, the whole world reacts and says, that is not right, that is not appropriate, that is incredibly harmful, because it's something that is good, sex should be, and it's something that can cause deep, deep pain. Why is sex just for within marriage? Because within that safe confines of giving yourself to another person, of devoting yourself, saying, I will love you, there is a safe place for you to enjoy being vulnerable, to share your bodies in in that way. And the tempting thing for us is to distrust God and think he's not good and say no to your ways, God. I'm going to reject you and I'm going to take things as I want them. So we've seen that marriage is a wonderful gift. Sex is a wonderful gift. This all sounds like marriage is the, is, is, is the aim, isn't it? Marriage is the big, glorious, wonderful gift. It's covenantal. It's a picture of the gospel. It's the only place that you should be able to enjoy sex. So shouldn't everybody just get married? Isn't that the right thing to do? This is the glorious gift, the jewel that we should all aim for. In Pops, verses 6 and 7, like a bit of a plot twist. Let me read them. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all of you were as I am, that being single. But each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Paul goes from championing marriage as this beautiful, wonderful gospel picture to putting it in his place. Paul concedes that he prefers being single to being married. He's not commanding that everyone needs to be single. He's saying singleness is a good gift. So is marriage and so is sex within marriage. And I don't want to talk too much about this because Matt will talk about singleness from verses 25 to 38. But let's deal with the text and and just be fair to it. It is saying that singleness is a good gift. Why? Because singleness allows us to fully devote ourselves towards God. Singleness allows us to be free in a way that you aren't in marriage, to be able to serve God and be entirely devoted to him without the other distractions, without the other requirements, without other responsibilities put on you. But it's worth saying that singleness isn't for everyone. It's good. Paul is esteeming it here. But if we are saying we do not desire that gift, perhaps it's not just the gift that you will have. There might be something else there. But let me just say to you, if you are single, we often push in the, in the Western church, marriage is this wonderful thing to aim for. Singleness very clearly here is a good gift. In fact, just as marriage mirrors the gospel with people giving of themselves covenantally, singleness uniquely mirrors the gospel. In a world which tells you that you need to have a relationship, you should take and have sex, you should do something, you should be, have some form of companionship, or if you're going to stay single, you should just do what makes you happy. Choosing to stay single and to say, actually, what we pray about, what we sing, what we say, Christ is enough for me, is a glorious light that pictures the gospel to everybody else around you. It is modeling and saying to those around you, you all say that I need these different things, but actually my claim that I say and that I hold to is that I need Christ and Christ alone as my deepest level of fulfillment. And that stands out to the world around us. It did throughout the Bible as John the Baptist lived it out, Paul, Apollos, Silas, Luke, Titus, Phoebe, and Lydia. 
It did when our good and perfect God and Savior, Jesus, lived out singleness perfectly as well. And it's done it throughout history as well. Missionary Amy Carmichael um, was famously single and gave her life to be able to help in orphanages throughout India. If you ever want to Wikipedia somebody, Wikipedia her, because she, she lived a wonderful life and it's just fascinating to read. But she famously says this, there is joy, joy found nowhere else. Where can we look up into Christ's face when he says to us, am I not enough for thee, mine own? With a true, yes, Lord, you are enough. Marriage is a good gift. Sex within marriage is a good gift. Singleness is also a wonderful gift. But I just want to get practical here for a very quick second and just say, historically, we've just touched on this. The UK church hasn't done a great job of championing singleness. We've often idolized marriage, making that the key normal as though family life is the thing to aim for, the gold standard. And sometimes, some churches within the West have treated people who are single with suspicion and marginalized them. Can I say, we've tried our best not to do that at City Church. We've done single days. We, we, we esteem and we value you, no matter what background you come from, and actually recognize that there are great gifts for us all to do. But we know that that tends to be the water that we swim in. If you are single, would you please make sure that you stick around in this church and share about how we can serve and love you better, how we can all work together because it is a good and wonderful thing that we see straight from the Bible. Singleness is a gift from God. Now, as a married person, I can't talk about all the gifts and the benefits of singleness, but I, I do want to take a moment just to point out two that I can see, but I want to just say what I'm incredibly grateful for. Number one, singles are huge blessings to the church because of their capacity to serve. Do you know that we, when we're talking about our building project, talked about how we need a month's worth of hours of volunteers. Volunteer hours, sorry. I need straight words, no good, I say. Um, they, we need a month's worth of volunteer hours just to run each week. Do you know where the majority of that comes from? Our single people who have the time and to do that. Can I just say, actually, if you have that time and that capacity and you choose to sacrifice that and give that towards your church, as, as part of this church, can I just say to you, seriously, thank you. It'd be very easy for you to want to do it and, and use it for something else, but it is incredibly generous. And, and, and I'm, for my part, really, really grateful for it. I get to see that happen, actually, with not just the way that you serve the church, but also the way that you serve families and children. My boy and my girl benefit from single people investing in their lives and encouraging them and building them up. My marriage is better and my parenting is better because of you. Again, let me say you are a gift to this church. You have been a gift to me personally. Please recognize that and know that we are grateful. Secondly, um, singleness is a huge benefit and a blessing because there is the, a unique opportunity for you to build relationships that married people just cannot do. You you have time in a way that, that we don't. I was actually chatting to um, a newly married friend the other week, and he was just lamenting the fact he, he was saying, man, I'm, I'm just time poor now. I've got a kid. I just, I, I, I can't hang out with people in the way that I used to and in the way that I want. You know, you know how you used to have those three o'clock in the morning conversations, which would just be deep and theological, and you'd think about everything and just bat those things around? Man, man they're gone, aren't they? And, and I had to turn around with them and go, yeah, they're gone for the next 20 years, mate. Sorry, um, they rarely gone. Um, like, that, that is true for people who, who are married. But single people, you have that opportunity. You know that we go to um, Common afterwards on a Sunday, and some of those conversations that we have are just about football. But sometimes the depth of those conversations are deeply wonderful and great. Would you notice that actually in the church there, or actually in your workplaces, you have an opportunity to have those types of gospel conversations that most married people just cannot. It is a huge gift to the church. It is a huge gift to the gospel. And it's a wonderful thing for us to look at. Now, all of that to say, we've just listed three wonderful things. Marriage being a gift. Sex being a gift. Singleness to be a gift as well. I am highly aware that as we finish, it's easy to look at one gift that you receive right now and wish you have another. To think and feel as though God is actually a bit like our auntie from Christmas, who got us a pair of socks when really you wanted an iPhone. And you're like, oh, thanks, that's wonderful. I mean, this isn't a good gift. But friends, 
the main point that we need to take from this passage is that God gives good gifts. He is not your auntie. He is not a distant relative. He is a God who loves you, who has given himself towards you, and who sacrifices for you. And actually, it would be incredibly easy and incredibly tempting for single people to go, ah, I want companionship. I'm, a, I'm highly aware in a room this big with this many people, there will be some people whose marriages are painful and difficult, and they might well be thinking, you know what? Talk about loneliness. Like, there is a new level of loneliness when you are struggling within your marriage. This is not a good gift. And the temptation in all of those situations is to go again, God, you are not good. Shove off. I'm in charge. No to your ways. Let me do and take what I want, and let me, let me make things work my way. That, I know that as I point that out, in a church on a Sunday when we've opened the Bible, it can sound a little bit silly, but isn't it so very easy? Isn't that why we use our language this way, where we say you can fall into envy, you can fall into bitterness. We don't say you fall into gratitude. We don't say you fall into happiness. We don't say that you just fall into delight within Christ. Those things take work for us as we think about, as we remind ourselves of his goodness and his character because it's so easy to just slip into comparison, into envy. Let me give you one quick example of this. Um, This guy up here is called Adio Resi, and he is a non-Christian significant entrepreneur. So by the age of 30, he had sold two companies for $1 billion. He is a CEO of a a company called the Founder Institute in Silicon Valley, and he literally just sends out schools everywhere around the world, 165 places, telling people how to be entrepreneurial, and he started 1,500 companies. I mean, that's just epic levels of success and fame and achievement. He is on the cover of a page from his work and his achievement alone. Famously though, he turns to his clinical psychologist, because if you're that rich, of course you have a personal clinical psychologist, and he said, I'm just not happy. I just, I feel depressed. I I feel like I've not achieved anything. And actually, when I'm thinking about it, it's getting me down. It's making me feel depressed. So obviously the clinical psychologist turns to him and goes, how, how can you think that? You have achieved so much. You are so successful. And his, his honest response was, well, when, when I was working within the companies, I would compare myself to the people around me. But then I was more successful than them. When I was thinking about the startup world, I'd compare everybody around me. And now that I am at the pinnacle of having achieved anything, I can't help but think that I've achieved nothing. Because I think back to my time with my housemate when I was back at uni and the dreams that we had and his success, and I just think, I've achieved nothing. So the clinical psychologist says, who, who, dude, who was your housemate? And Adeo says, Elon Musk. If you don't know who Elon Musk is, he's a guy who's um, made electric cars, sent something into space, and set up a, a multi-million dollar company that was just making flamethrowers insane. I don't, don't understand why that would be a thing. But all that to say, All of us would say, actually, if we had that level of success, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Wouldn't that be a great achievement? But Adeo himself admits that he he was unhappy because he was comparing himself to the wrong thing. Really successful people aren't necessarily happy because the people they compare themselves to changes. Really gifted people, really blessed people, aren't necessarily happy if they compare themselves to each other rather than a God who judges them fairly, then sacrifices himself for them, and loves them eternally. Friends, you might have the gift of singleness. You might have the gift of marriage. You might, in, within your marriage, have the gift of sex. Or you might, even for a time, have the gift of singleness and move into marriage. Or even, in some cases, you might have the gift of marriage and then be widowed. Or, in appropriate stages, you might even have to look at divorce. Ralph will talk about that next week. I don't want to... Um, take too much of that. But I want to be clear that our ultimate aim needs to not be these gifts. It needs to be God. If marriage becomes our goal, then you make an idol of marriage and you will be lonely. If freedom becomes your goal, then you will push people aside and you will find yourself alone. If sex becomes your ultimate idol, then you will take from other people and you will hurt them. It's only our relationship with Jesus through faith that we get something eternal. 
We become part of his spiritual family, the church, which lasts forever. Do you know that? Marriage someday will fade. It is an earthly thing that we get to enjoy, but it's not going to be eternal. But what we enjoy with God, what we enjoy with each other, that will last forever. A life given to God and a life given to others is good. This is a call for both singled and singles and married people. And it's perfectly demonstrated by Jesus who gave his life to you through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ, we are completely received by God. Not only that, God gives himself to you in that picture that we see that is like marriage. And because of that, we get the wonderful situation where we get to call him our God. Let me pray and we're going to respond to this. Father, we thank you that ultimately marriage is a beautiful picture of your love for us. We thank you that in that there is the blessing of sex. And God, we thank you that singleness is a wonderful picture of you, but all of these things are gifts. They are not the final aim. The aim is you, the good giver, who has loved us, who has given yourself to us, and who calls us to do the same. Help us, we pray, as we are so often selfish, as we are so often want to take what is ours, would you help us to be different, to be self-giving, to be of us who choose not to fall into envy, choose not to fall into distrusting you, choose not to do all those things, but choose to work hard at knowing that you've already achieved everything. Work hard at reminding our hearts, reminding our souls that you have loved us. And because of that, no matter what life stage we are in, we can enjoy you to the fullest. We can have life to the fullest right now. Amen.